section twenty of the early tudors by charles edward moberly this librivox recording is in the public domain read by pamela nagami chapter fourteen the dissolution of the monasteries the pilgrimage of grace fifteen thirty five to fifteen thirty eight part two after all the act distinguished the houses that were to be suppressed not by their greater immorality but as wolsey had done by their less wealth parliament had heard from the king so said the act of enormities done in the abbeys he in turn had learned these from his commissioners and from other credible witnesses it was therefore ordained that those which had an income less than two hundred pounds a year should revert to the crown instead of to the founder's heirs as we might have expected but henry was authorized to preserve as many of them as he pleased by letters patent and out of the three hundred and seventy-six then confiscated thirty-seven were refounded in the following august and remained till the general dissolution at first a fresh commission had been formed in which neighbouring gentlemen were in each case included to settle which should be preserved but the reports from this were so uniformly favourable to the abbeys that henry rudely accused the members of receiving bribes and soon cancelled it he at the same time placed the remaining monasteries under a rule which aimed at shutting up monks rather than utilizing them and rather than submit to this a number surrendered to him of their own accord such was the celebrated visitation of the monasteries instead of being made centres of learning and education they were generally demolished and the materials sold by the courtiers to whom henry granted them how far the monks deserved their fate there is little evidence to show as church writers of earlier times seldom spared accusations of immorality against the regular clergy and as these bodies had very little effective visitation it is natural to suppose that their morals would in some cases be those of a large school or college left to itself but it is not to be supposed that the record office contains a huge mystery of iniquity in documents which escape publication by being too bad for it it is to be feared that historians will always be reduced in the absence of sufficient evidence either way to acquit or condemn these institutions rather by their own notions of the probable than on any convincing arguments as the year fifteen thirty six rolled on it was plain that the conspiring lords had lost their opportunity the emperor in whose help they trusted was now most unlikely to send troops either to england or ireland as a fresh war with france for milan had broken out and by august in this year the sovereigns were engaged in a cross invasion with the result that francis fortified himself in turin while the emperor lost thirty thousand of his veterans from famine and disease in his attack on provence consequently the northern peers remained inactive though sullen and the conspiracy would probably have died out had not the commons of the same counties suddenly blazed into an insurrection from motives partly the same as those of the nobles and partly peculiar to themselves like their betters they objected to the plebeian advisers of the king the promotion of cranmer and other heretics in the church and the suppression of the monasteries and a new statute of uses which made it very difficult for landowners to throw on their estates the charge of providing for their younger children but as a revolution is seldom really vigorous unless a question of land is at the bottom of it so to these grievances was added a deep-felt middle-class discontent at the system of enclosures and sheep-feeding which still continued to harass farmers of the old school in a manner which they only half understood but entirely resented the town of louth in the marshes of east lincolnshire is even now somewhat out of the world the country round it is so intersected with cuts so liable to inroads of the sea and so incapable of growing trees that field sports were out of the question in it therefore the resident gentry are few and a system of small holdings still prevails there creating as usual a most independent spirit in the owners this was the district where revolt was first to show itself 
the nunnery of Legbourn, close to the town, was on the point of suppression, and Heneage, one of the visitors, was expected with the Chancellor of Lincoln Cathedral on this unpopular errand. On Monday, the 2nd of October, 1536, he arrived, and a furious riot instantly broke out, from which he took refuge in the church, but was brought back and forced to swear that he would be true to the commons. The book containing Cromwell's commission was torn in pieces and his servants placed in the stocks. Shortly after this, a similar rising began at Horncastle and was joined by a number of gentry and by the abbot of Barlings, who appeared with his cannons in full armor. There, too, the celebrated banner of the Five Wounds of Christ was raised for the first time. The unhappy chancellor fell into the hands of the mob and was murdered, and on the same day there was a rising at Lincoln, and Bishop Longland's palace was plundered. If the nobles had now come forward to head the movement and strengthened it by the forces at their command, Henry's reign and life might soon have come to an end together. However, Lord Hussey, who had spoken much of rebellion, could not persuade himself to take either side, but remained inactive at Sleaford, and within a week from the outbreak the advanced guard of the royal forces arrived at Stamford. Two days later the Duke of Suffolk with the main body joined them to hear that the insurrection was already breaking up. In this emergency Henry had shown a really royal firmness, not ill-pleased, perhaps, to have nobler occupations than those which had so long enthralled him. To the written demands of the rioters for the dismissal of low councillors and the like, he replied that the rude commons of one shire and that one of the most brute and beastly of the whole realm should not be allowed to rule their prince. His orders were that they should disperse at once and surrender a hundred of their chief men. Expecting on this to be delivered up, the leaders thought of cutting their way through and placing themselves in Suffolk's hands. They were, however, allowed to pass without resistance, and the first act of the pilgrimage of grace was at an end. But a far harder trial was to come, for on the 8th of October a much better organized insurrection burst out in Yorkshire. A paper urging a rebellion for the sake of God's truth had been circulated in that county under the signature of a popular young lawyer named Robert Ask, who had been watching the Lincolnshire events and on returning home, although he declared that he knew nothing of the paper, he found himself stormily welcomed as leader. Lord Darcy, the chief person in Yorkshire, followed Lord Hussey's example in temporizing and shut himself up with a few foreigners in Pontefract Castle, although he had been all along one of the conspiring nobles and was favorable to the objects proposed by the rebels, who, on the 14th of October, mustered on Wayton Heath about 18 miles east of York, their troops being picked men, well armed and equipped for war. Having summoned Hull in vain, they left half their forces to besiege it, while the rest marched on York, and were unhesitatingly welcomed there. The monasteries were cleared and their old inhabitants restored. They then marched to Pontefract, where, after some hesitation, Lord Darcy joined them just when Lord Shrewsbury was at hand with forces for his relief. Soon Hull surrendered, and at length the small castle of Skipton, which still remains entire, was the only strong place in Yorkshire unsubdued, while large rebel reinforcements were arriving from Durham under Lords Latimer and Lumley, and two sons of the Duke of Northumberland had already brought up the standard of St. Cuthbert for a southward march. Even the Archbishop of York, who had been with Lord Darcy at Pontefract, had for the time given in his adhesion. Thirty thousand excellent troops now moved under Ask's command against Doncaster, more than a third of them being mounted and clad in armor. But Henry, mingling prudence with firmness, used a variety of means to break it up. Reminding Lord Latimer and others how disgraceful to them it was to be serving under a man of such low rank as Ask, and explaining by means of papers scattered all over the north that a plan of Cromwell's for parish registers had no reference to taxation, and that none of the recent church measures had been hostile to true religion. 
when the rebels reached the banks of the don they found that he had wisely opposed to them the duke of norfolk and lords shrewsbury rutland huntington and talbot all men popular in the north yet evidently resolved to obey the king's orders whatever happened it was impossible to force doncaster bridge in face of their artillery and twice when an attack had been planned a storm made the river too deep to cross the flood seeming as fatal to the pilgrimage of grace as that of the severn had been to buckingham's revolt in fourteen eighty three thus ask was compelled to negotiate his terms being that all concerned should receive a pardon and that their articles of accommodation should be transmitted to the king these included restoration of the pope's authority and condign punishment for all concerned in overthrowing it among whom cromwell leighton and lee and the reforming bishops were especially named the penalty suggested for the last being fire or such other remission of taxes enforcement of the acts against enclosure and a few others but henry now began to feel that the game was in his own hands ask and darcy were he plainly saw men who wished for revolution only if it could be had without overt acts of rebellion he therefore detained ask's messengers for a fortnight firmly refusing to hold a parliament till the crisis was over or even to grant an unreserved pardon the leaders would he felt sure find their scheme of a northern parliament impracticable and be unable to get help in time from the emperor or to bring over to them the country south of the trent he therefore ordered norfolk to reoccupy the line of the don which he had abandoned and to maintain it at all hazards yet as more and more insurgents gradually came in from the north and the severe weather made it difficult to keep the field against them henry was at last induced to relent on the second of december news came that he had granted a full pardon promised to hold a parliament at york and consented to inquire into the question of enclosures on hearing this ask instantly threw off his badge with the five wounds and declared that henceforth he would wear no device but the king's nor was henry unfaithful for the time at least to his part of the compact he had before checked and reproved as dishonourable norfolk's desire to make terms with the intention of breaking them and he now admitted to his presence the insurgent leaders and explained to them how little reason there had been for the outbreak one of these was ask himself the king said that he took him now for his faithful subject and wished to hear from him the history of the rebellion ask in return warned the king of the dangerous discontent still remaining in yorkshire and of the general fear that the pardon would be delusive in fact early in fifteen thirty seven partial insurrections entirely disavowed by the late leaders were raised by sir francis by god in yorkshire and by nicol musgrave in cumberland as these were believed to have been instigated by the monks express and stern orders were sent to put to death any who were taken and in obedience to these about seventy-four persons were hanged on the walls of carlisle of the lincolnshire prisoners nineteen with lord hussey were executed after trial and saddest of all the new insurrections drew on the death of ask and his colleagues who were alleged on slight evidence to have gone against the government in them and thus to have forfeited their pardon lady bulmer was burned alive in smithfield for a plot to carry off the duke of norfolk the abbots of fountains and jorvo were hanged and strangely enough lancaster herald the king's own messenger who had boldly faced ask at pontefract now shared the same fate because he had disgraced his tabard by kneeling to a rebel in order to dissuade him from his enterprise in spite of the treasons of the northern abbots their monasteries were not at once confiscated but their offence was held to be a sufficient reason for claiming possession at any time there is a curious lancashire tradition that the abbot of Wally had been driven into insurrection by a stratagem of asks who managed to get the great convent beacon fired and so made it appear that the signal had been given by the abbot himself if this is true 
it did not save the unfortunate man's life nor his monastery soon the great abbeys of jervaux bridlington and furness were suppressed and not long after this chertsey castleacre lewis and leicester surrendered under the old act to these must be added st augustine's canterbury the mother of english christianity which has been so nobly and happily restored in our own time as a hard-working missionary college the point to which the english reformation had now advanced doctrinally is indicated by two events one of these was henry's passionate refusal to let england be represented at the council of mantua which even luther had accepted in fifteen thirty five on the proposal of the lately elected pope paul the third and his vehement exertions to hinder the german protestants from attending it on the grounds that it belonged not to the pope but to princes to summon such assemblies the other was the publication by authority in fifteen thirty seven of the institution of a christian man drawn up chiefly by cranmer and bishop fox and generally called the bishop's book its plan was to represent the christian faith article by article not as bare dogmas but as powerful to influence men's hearts and lives it is anti-roman mainly as teaching that wherever the faith is held there the church is and that no church has rule over any other in contrasting strongly the church militant and its admixture of evil with the invisible and unfailing church unseen and in speaking much more of the work of the priesthood and their obedience to civil rule than of inherent powers possessed by them while in terms admitting seven sacraments it still defines them much as protestants would have done it is curious that it repeatedly prohibits as offensive to god all divination palmistry or witchcraft and an act of parliament passed in fifteen forty one throws light on this by showing that a system had grown up of searching by supernatural means for the treasures built up or buried in the ruined monasteries whose exact position was now forgotten on the twentieth of october fifteen thirty seven the long wished for prince of wales was at length born and many regulations were made for watching a life so precious at the same time the queen's brother sir edward seymour was made earl of hertford sir william fitzwilliams earl of southampton and sir w russell lord russell as if it were fated that the hope of the dynasty was to rest on one son the queen who seemed at first to be doing well took cold and died in four days her virtues and graces have been exaggerated by history yet henry's grief was sincere and proved by his ordering twelve hundred masses for her soul and remaining a widower until fifteen thirty nine the submissions which the princess mary had been long offering were now accepted and though not acknowledged as legitimate it was understood that she was placed in the line of succession about the same time the navy which was in the utmost decay was so far restored as to be able to guard our coasts from the secure insolence of pirates considering henry's early predilection for the sea it is strange to hear of spaniards and frenchmen daring to attack one another in our harbours and of english vessels being plundered by corsairs within sight of land however a small fleet was now fitted out which successfully fought a french plundering squadron in mount's bay single pirates were captured here and there and our harbours put in a state of defence the expenses were paid out of the abbeys this being the chief national purpose except indeed the foundation of six new bishoprics achieved by the many spoliations which went on through fifteen thirty eight and fifteen thirty nine one remarkable instance of them was the destruction of the shrine of st thomas of canterbury from which twenty-six cartloads of treasure were taken a paragraph added at this time to the unpublished bill of deposition gives some credit to the story that st thomas himself was summoned to appear much as the dead pope formosus was by his successor and plead to the charge of treason against henry the second on the same view of history a friar named forrest who had asserted that becket and fisher were alike martyrs 
was burned in a fire made from the wood of a celebrated Welsh image called Derfel Gadarn, which had been supposed to have power to draw souls out of hell. An exhibition was also made at court of the mechanism by which the statue of Christ at Boxley had been made to move its head and weep. It really seemed as if the Reformation had taken the holding turn. Such certainly was Latimer's view when he preached Forrest's death sermon in the firm belief that the birth of Edward had secured the victory of Protestantism among us and made God, as he expressed it, really an English God. But causes of an opposite tendency were also at work, undivined by the simple-minded Bishop of Worcester. Negotiations had been going on for the king's marriage with the Duchess of Milan, Charles V's niece, and this required, from the lady's point of view, a papal dispensation. Such difficulties might possibly be got over by inducing the emperor to break with the pope as Henry had done, but there was absolutely no hope of this, unless England could be shown to be orthodox in spite of the schism. Henry was also moved in the same direction by a letter from the Landgrave of Hesse against Anabaptism, which had shocked all Germany in 1535 by its unbridled rule of polygamy and murder at Münster. It is also clear that he felt deeply scandalized by the profanity and mockery of holy things which was getting rife in his own dominions. All these motives made him wish to give some striking proof that his faith was sound, and a suitable opportunity soon occurred. John Lambert, who had been a friend of Tyndall, was condemned in the archbishop's court for denying transubstantiation and appeal to the king. Henry heard the cause in person at Whitehall, showing his animus against the prisoner by taunting him with having two names, forced him to say I or no without qualification to the question whether Christ's body is in the sacrament, crushed him with the text, This is my body, and left him to die, saying that the king would be no patron of heretics. This was evidently no freak or accident, but the sign of a settled policy. The next chapter will show how it was to be carried out, how resisted, and in what the resistance was to end. End of section 20